I'm Roy Clark, Professor of Physics here at the University of Michigan, and um, co-host of this event along with uh, my colleague Tim Chupp. It's my great pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Oliver Krifgans, Research Professor of Biomedical Engineering and Radiology, and also uh, a Professor of Applied Physics. At a time when we were building a, a very strong interdisciplinary set of connections with other departments on the campus in the form of an interdisciplinary program called uh, Applied Physics, we were very fortunate to have Oliver join us at the University of Michigan as a PhD student uh, quite a while ago now. And um, after completing, that was after completing his master's in physics at um, the uh, University of Saarland in uh, Germany, in conjunction with the renowned uh, Fraunhofer Institute of Biomedical Engineering. His research tra trajectory since then has uh, as a faculty member at the U of M, has focused on the advancement of science of medical ultrasound, as well as its clinical implementation. And he's been responsible for making many important strides in uh, the areas of both diagnostics, medical diagnostics and therapeutics. And that's what he's going to be talking about today. Uh, we will be having a question and answer session after Dr. Kripkan's presentation. So please submit your questions. Um, if you're listening to this online uh, through this email address, physics at umich.edu or uh, write your questions on a card if you're here in the auditorium. Now, without further ado, let's give a warm ultrasonic welcome <laughs> to our speaker. Okay. Thank you, Professor Clark, uh, for this very kind uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Professor Clark and the, the committee members uh, for uh, the selection of the Saturday morning physics speakers for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Uh, I thank everybody in the audience to come here today and uh, show interest in this presentation and in Saturday morning physics at all. Uh, and I thank the uh, audio video crew here uh, for taking the Saturday morning uh, to help out. And I'd like to thank uh, Monica Wood uh, for assisting me this morning with uh, experiments. Uh, yeah, it has been a long journey. I came in 1996 uh, from Germany with a master's in, in physics, um, had shown from the beginning interest in applied physics, uh, was thrilled by the applied physics program here at the University of Michigan that, sorry, I did not know about, uh, but uh, <laughs> learned since then that it's just fantastic, uh, uh, involving many disciplines across campus and uh, being very successful uh, in, in part because of the excellent leadership that has always been in place in applied physics. Uh, so let's, let's dive in. Um, we're gonna take, talk about ultrasound. I'm gonna stand on this side so I can see my slides. And uh, uh, some of you might say ultrasound, what, what is that? Some of you might uh, remember that, well, ultrasound is often used in the, in the clinic. Uh, uh, some of you might say, well, you look at baby faces. And those baby faces have actually come along really well. Uh, I mean, this, this is an ultrasonic image. Uh, this is not a photograph, and they have uh, certainly reached photographic uh, uh, quality, though that's not the main purpose of ultrasound. 
Um, so let's keep going here. Um, I always have to talk about disclosures. Uh, I'm not paid for this presentation. I don't get uh, money or any other compensation except for being able to put a line on my CV, which I'm really honored to do. Um, there is a, a book we wrote at some point uh, uh, during the pandemic and before that uh, if you purchase that, then I would actually get some money, but I'm not gonna get rich that way. Um, uh, the main purpose is to do uh, research and uh, we love our research as indicated by the smiley here. Research uh, is something really meaningful uh, and uh, you never know where you end up. I would have never thought that I would study physics. Uh, in fact, I wasn't that good at physics in high school. I wasn't bad, but I, I wasn't that good. And then when it was time to go to university, uh, my, my fellow students were all picking various uh, topics that they were interested in studying. And I thought, well, I don't really know what I want to study. Uh, I knew it wasn't uh, language because I was so bad in high school and before in English that my teacher told me I should just stop taking English, which I did. And um, so uh, I looked through the study guide uh, for the universities and I thought, well, okay, what, what am I gonna study? People go into electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, computer science and all that stuff. And I thought, I'm not, I, I like everything a little bit. So I ended up with physics because physics is a little bit of everything. Uh, you study mechanics, you study electrodynamics, you study all sorts of things. And uh, I think physics can be a really, really nice platform for a boatload of, of jobs later on and passions. And so uh, let's, let's continue here. So we're, we're making good use of this hour, which I'm already, be, be ready for a waterfall of, of me speaking and I hope you don't get tired of it. So uh, ultrasound or sound in general is, uh, is a, an, a, a, a mechanical wave that is propagating here in this room through the air, uh, in the body, through the, through the tissues, which are mostly water. So the, the propagation is mostly based on that of sound and water. And uh, while there can be a whole bunch of different waves, uh, predominantly longitudinal waves are used for ultrasonic imaging, transverse waves a little bit. Longitudinal waves, they, uh, the, the wave uh, propagates in the same direction as the particles swing back and forth. And while this looks like the particles are moving to the right, they're not really. There's a red particle here, there's one here, and there's one there. And if you follow them, you see that they actually stay more or less in place. They oscillate around their, their, their resting point. But it's this, this, this collective motion that then makes it look like there is a wave propagating to the right. Uh, the transverse wave, is that the particles are, in this case, uh, oscillating up and down, but the wave is propagating uh, uh, left to right. And so again, for ultrasonic imaging, we use that one. We push on the matter in front of us, and that pushes on the matter in front of that, just like when you're standing in line for your favorite sports event. Um, uh, so this, since this is a physics talk, uh, I'm actually allowed to put up an equation. Uh, if I give talks in more medical oriented settings, uh, they don't really like equations that much, uh, even though equations can be fun. Uh, this is the wave equation, very appropriate for talking about physics, or uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, ultrasound. This is the linear form, so it's the most simple form of the wave equation. And it's a second order partial differ, uh, uh, differential, or uh, second order uh, differential equation. Uh, and so uh, it has uh, only uh, uh, four quantities in here. P is the pressure, uh, T is the time, C is the speed of sound, and X is the location. And what this means is that if you have a pressure that varies, then it can produce an acoustic wave. Uh, we have pressure here in the room, this, just the static air pressure, about 100 kilopascals, so one atmosphere. That doesn't produce uh, a, a wave because uh, the static pressure doesn't survive that uh, second order partial differential equation. Uh, it will be zero after the first differentiation. Uh, if you have a pressure that just changes linearly, it still doesn't produce a sound. It has to, pr it has to change uh, uh, more than linearly so that it survives the second order differential equation. And so like a cosine or a sine, a periodic motion that is constantly changing, that survives it. And so most of the, the excitations that you see in ultrasonics for imaging, they're based on sines and cosines. And so uh, this equation here relates time with space. So you, 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 um, you excite a wave at, at one time at one position, and then at a later time at a different position, you can observe that wave because it travels there. And they are coupled by the speed of sound. And you put a square in there so that it's actually the speed of sound that you're measuring and not some kind of uh, other quantity that is related to the speed of sound. So that's, that's the very simple uh, uh, relationship between a pressure, a pressure change, some time, and some space. Here's an example. This looks a little bit like a sinusoid. It's a damped sinusoid that has the, uh, an envelope of the shape of a Gaussian 
uh, curve. And uh, this is excited. Uh, this, 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 this signal is produced. It excites an ultrasonic wave. It travels and it interacts with, with tissues or materials. And then it might be reflected, but we're going to get into that. For the physicists in, in the audience or people interested, excitations are usually in the nanometer range. And pressures that come out are maybe in the kilopascal or megapascal range. In this case, a 10 nanometer excitation produces about an atmosphere response. And speed of sound in tissues is about a mile per second. Uh, I prefer SI units, but this is really easy to remember, uh, especially if you're not familiar uh, with, 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 with physics too much. So about a mile per, per second. Uh, speed of sound in air is about 330 meters per second, 340 meters per second, so a lot less. Uh, ultrasound is produced in the same way as, as you might be familiar with, with loudspeakers. You have a system that has a membrane that is displaced. It displaces in a fashion that is more than linear, so like a sinusoid, and that produces with a loudspeaker probably uh, frequencies in the, in the range of hertz to kilohertz. With ultrasound, it's different. Uh, that's the word ultra. It's beyond the hearing limit of, of 20 uh, kilohertz. Uh, ultrasound goes in the, in the medical range, typically from kilohertz to gigahertz. In medical ultrasound, most likely megahertz. Uh, it really depends on the application. It's really nice to see how applications have spread to both sides of, of that constraint. They went down from the megahertz into the kilohertz for some applications, and then they went up from the megahertz into the gigahertz for others. Oh, I forgot to mention that in, in a loudspeaker, you have a, a, a membrane that you displace, uh, probably with an electromagnetic coil. In ultrasound, you have a piezoelectric crystal. It has a lattice structure in there that uh, changes uh, thickness as you apply a voltage. If you apply a positive voltage, it's, it's one type of change. If you apply the negative one, it's the opposite. So you can make this, the, the, the crystal uh, expand and contract. Uh, so here is um, a basic uh, uh, understanding of an ultrasound transducer, a so-called single element transducer. It has a crystal in there that's indicated in blue. Uh, the crystal is um, related to the frequency that you want to excite it with. And so uh, at one megahertz uh, for water, it would be one and a half millimeters. But the speed of sound in these, in these crystals is much higher, so they are thinner. And so uh, uh, the, the, the crystals are at lambda over two. Uh, in front of the crystals are matching layers that allow us to actually get the sound out and let it propagate. Those matching layers are typically lambda over four, and then in front of those is a lens uh, that is used to focus or pre-focus the sound for a given application. And so uh, this is a very basic understanding of what, what an ultrasound transducer looks like in case you want to build one. You can actually buy the materials in Nowadays, with electronic kits, you can actually make these uh, quite easily. And so we have a first live demonstration. Uh, Monica Wood has helped me uh, select and uh, prepare, actually, not helped me, she helped me by doing it, uh, uh, select and prepare um, uh, four different types of experiments. The first one is uh, a mechanical uh, oscillator here. Uh, there are uh, three different uh, structures on here. These are metal strips. They have a weight at the end, and they have a resonance frequency. And we're going to drive that uh, with this uh, wobbler. And over here is a function generator. It has a frequency dial and then a voltage, two volts peak, and nine megahertz, uh, sorry, <laughs> megahertz, yeah, uh, nine hertz oscillation frequency. So if we turn this on, we see that the, um, the, the longest one is now is, is, is oscillating quite well. You see it with the, with the amplitude. And then the following ones are merely uh, oscillating. They're just coupling here through the structure, and that's why they're, uh, why they're displacing it all. If I now put my hand here so you see the display. If I now come up to 10 hertz, you see that the amplitude goes down. If I go to 11, now you see that the middle one starts oscillating. I go to 12. So as the frequency goes up, the smaller structures are uh, going in or through resonance. Can go up here and can go faster. And now, I think I exceeded it already, but this is now at 15 hertz, the little structure. So you can see in a very simple uh, experiment here how um, frequencies relate to structure. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, so ultrasound, um, as a use in, in, in medical ultrasound, is uh, almost entirely now based on uh, antennas. Uh, the, the, uh, all, if, if, yeah, all, pretty much all uh, understanding that comes for ultrasonic uh, uh, generation or uh, propagation uh, comes from antenna theory, has really benefited from radar uh, and related fields. Uh, an ultrasonic antenna 
Uh, most of them are spaced uh, or arranged as arrays. This here is called a linear array. In a linear array, as the name says, you, you take a structure and place it in a linear fashion. And in ultrasonic imaging, linear array implies that they are spaced at lambda. So for a given uh, frequency that you use in the body, you would make a transducer that has that element spacing. And so you cannot easily switch between uh, really low and really high frequencies. You would need a new, uh, a new device. Uh, in this case, uh, sp uh, spaced at lambda, there are some gaps in between so that they don't couple. You have seen this here uh, with these structures. They couple very easily through. You don't want that. And you can decouple them with special techniques. And then uh, these arrays are typically 100 to 200 elements. And so if you have an ultrasonic transducer like this one uh, in here, are probably close to 200 elements. And it tells you that that you have to be really careful with that cable that is on there. You don't step on it. You don't roll the ultrasound machine on it. You, you don't do anything uh, crazy with it because it will just ruin the transducer. And, and these elements are quite small. And so they're, they're very sensitive and they're very delicate, but they have been perfected to a degree that you can get beautiful images with this, from a physics point of view, relative simple uh, technology. Uh, now let's look at ultrasonic wave propagation. Uh, here's the transducer. It doesn't matter if it's a single element transducer or a, an array. Um, you, you excite a wave here. The wave travels into, let's say, tissue one here. Let's say it be the, the superficial layers of the skin. And it will keep traveling until the acoustic energy is all gone. Along the way, the energy can get absorbed. It is converted into heat. Or it can get reflected or scattered. And so these reflections, let's not get into scattering, but let's look at reflections. These reflections take place between different tissue types. And what's, what's dictating what's the different tissue type is what's called the acoustic impedance. And that's why you don't hear me outside in the neighboring room, because there's a wall, and that wall presents an acoustic impedance. And acoustic impedances, they are abbreviated by the letter Z, and uh, they are defined by the speed of sound in the material and the mass density. And so um, um, in, in, in case you have no relationship to this, and you say, well, I, I don't really know what that means. Uh, if you go sledding, and you sled down a hill, and you get pretty good speed, you're, you're gliding on, on snow, and suddenly you hit a rough patch of, of, of grass. That's when the speed uh, really changes. And you know what that means. You're changing direction. You slow down a lot. You're not quite bouncing back. But uh, it changes the way you propagate with your sled. Now, if there is a change in the density, that would be if you encounter a tree. Uh, that is a sudden uh, mass that you now try to displace. And it doesn't really work well. The tree is usually stronger, unless it's a bonsai. And so uh, you will bounce back. And so the same is true for ultrasound. <clears throat> and it works so well that you can use it for imaging. OK, now we have another live demonstration here. And uh, <clears throat> what we will be looking at is uh, this fabulous set here of, of rods that are coupled with a wire. And so we're looking at torsion waves. And uh, Monica, you can go ahead. Uh, Monica is exciting uh, the, the, the part of the setup that is on her side. And the rods there are small, so they have not as much mass as the, the rods that are on my side. And so the wave that she is exciting on her side gets in part reflected, you can switch them now, uh, is in part reflected by the larger rods. And so this would be the same as if I'm traveling uh, from, wrong direction, if I'm traveling uh, from one medium of uh, a smaller mass or a smaller density into a medium with a larger density. And um, while you can't do that in the body, you can do it with the ultrasound transducer, and that is that matching layer that I mentioned. So if, you, if, it's, a, if it's a controlled system where you, where you have uh, the ability uh, to, to couple things together, you put a transition layer in there, and then the transducer is the matching layer. And when I go, go ahead. Uh, and in this case, uh, now the wave has a gradual change in the mass where the rods in this, in this transition layer are gradually increasing. Now, if you look at this very carefully and you do the, 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 the modeling of it, you'll see that maybe it doesn't really have to be a linear increase. Maybe it can be a different type of increase. But what this demonstrates is that if you have a sharp transition, you get a stronger reflection. If the, if the transition is gradual, you get a smaller transition and you have more energy going forward. Thank you, Monica. Uh, mathematically, this reflection is expressed by the difference in the impedances. So if you impedance one, impedance two, you take the difference, you divide them by the sum. That is the reflection coefficient. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. OK, uh, now that you know how to produce sound, how to uh, propagate sound, uh, why you would get reflections, now you can actually look at, at images. 
and I can't decide which screen I should look at because there are three, and I want to look at you too, so I'm a little bit in a, in a, in a, in a constrained environment here. Uh, this is an ultrasonic image. It's called a, uh, a B-mode image for brightness mode. And what it does is that the transducer is placed, in this case, on the abdomen of, of a pregnant uh, a mom. And uh, the, the, the ultrasound is uh, excited to, to travel uh, into the body along these yellow arrows. Uh, the, the field of view is a pie shape just to get a larger field of view. Uh, you could just send them down in parallel lines, but then the field of view would naturally be smaller and be dictated by the projection of this aperture up here, the antenna. But if you, if you have it angled, then you can gain uh, lateral space by traveling farther. And so for uh, obstetric images, this is very helpful. In here is a fetus. Uh, the fetus head is right over here, as conveniently labeled by the text uh, for you and for me to remember. Uh, this is the skull. And uh, the skull has a much higher density than the surrounding water or uh, amniotic fluid. And so that's why you get a strong reflection. And, uh, but the, strong, the skull is not so strong that it reflects all of the sound. So you can actually see the other side. So if, if uh, the, the, the top here is, the, is the, um, uh, the front of the face, the front of the head, and here's the back. And so you, the sound travels all the way through when you see the back reflection too. And so in, in, in utero, this is used uh, to uh, estimate if the fetus is growing at the anticipated rate. There are growth charts, and then you can see what, what percentile is my child, for example, at the 20-week checkup. Uh, the, the remainder of the body here is, is the back. You see some kind of periodic structure. This is the spine. Uh, up here in a live image, you would see the, the fingers, uh, the bones of the fingers. And the black part here is the amniotic fluid. And again, ultrasound produces a scatter or a reflection if there is a change in speed of sound or a change in density. And in a fluid that is quite homogeneous, you will not see big changes. And therefore, this part is, is, uh, is uh, dark. Uh, if you take images of, uh, of milk, then you will actually see quite a lot of reflections because you have all these oil droplets uh, floating around in there and they all scatter sound and reflect sound. And so, uh, but a fluid that is very homogeneous will just appear black. Uh, the image on the left is a curvy linear array. It's, it's a curved uh, 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 antenna and it produces this type of image. On the right is a vector array or a 2D array and it can produce three-dimensional images. So instead of just one plane, it can produce many planes, i.e. a whole volume. And with that, if you have the amniotic fluid around, you can use that to figure out where surfaces are, and then you can actually show an entire 3D description uh, in, in 2D, because we, we don't really see 3D. When, when, when you say, well, I can see 3D, this is all 3D. No, 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 we see surfaces. We don't see 3D. I cannot see through a body. I can only see the surfaces, and the same is true for ultrasound. And I hope you're not as tired as this fellow. Uh, so what's next? Well, uh, the basics of ultrasound, while they can be presented maybe in 10 minutes, and I don't know what I'm at now, uh, there's a lot more to it, but there's no time here. But uh, currently, uh, ultrasonic imaging is, is progressing like, like crazy because of a lot of technologies that are enabling it. Faster computing really helps a lot with uh, uh, signal interpretation. Uh, better electronics, better signal-to-noise, better integration, all these things help with better signal generation. And so all of that together uh, makes for amazing uh, uh, changes in ultrasonic imaging. Uh, one of the, one of the um, uh, attempts to make ultrasonic imaging in the clinic better is uh, the Quantitative Imaging Biomarker Alliance, or KIBA, QIBA, uh, uh, and it's uh, from the uh, Radiological Society of North America, the RSNA, and they attempt making medical imaging in, in general better. So it's not just ultrasound, say TMR, uh, uh, nuclear medicine, and, and maybe others that I'm forgetting right now, but ultrasound is one of them, and the attempt is to focus on numbers on reproducibility. We are all different, and because we are all different, we need to make sure that if, if you measure my temperature, if you measure my blood pressure, or if you measure something with, with uh, imaging methods in my body, that it's actually what's representing me, and that if you do it at two different devices, that they measure the same thing. Or if you do two different operators, they still measure the same thing. Otherwise, it would be a fruitless undertaking. So Kiba is, is working on this with many volunteers, including our lab. So let's look at uh, uh, blood measurement or blood flow measurements. On ultrasounding images, you, you have seen the, the, the grayscale image, the B-mode image. You can overlay color, and that color represents blood flow. 
And uh, the physicists here in the audience might say, wow, cool, this is really nice. This is Doppler. I can, I know Doppler. Uh, it's when the car comes by or the, the, the ambulance or the, the police car and you see the, the change in frequency. As the car approaches you, frequency is high. As the car uh, uh, pads, uh, the frequency is low. And so that's entirely based on the Doppler effect. And uh, while Doppler can be used to look at blood flow, it's not really a good idea. And I tell you very quickly why. So if you look at Doppler and you plug in the, 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 the parameters for the, for the Doppler shift equation, blood moves, let's say, at 30 centimeters per second. It's a pretty good uh, uh, estimate. It's, it's higher and lower depending on where you're in the body. Uh, a frequency of 5 megahertz is good, but we do it fractional of that frequency anyways. There's a certain angle because you might not look head on. You might be at a certain angle of it. Uh, 60 degrees fine gives you a factor of two, I mean half. And so when you plug that in, you get a very small frequency shift. And that is because the speed of sound is so much faster than what you're looking at. And so because of that, because of this really small frequency shift, it's not really practical. As a physicist, you might say, well, I can measure that. I make a really careful experiment in the lab, all controlled. Yes, you can. And in astronomy, honestly, I don't know what the frequency shifts are, but I wouldn't be surprised if they're much smaller than that. Who knows? But in the body, you can't do that. And I'll show you why. Uh, as a physicist or as a high school graduate, you might say, well, I knew something about attenuation or about absorption. There's a law that says things are absorbed with, a, a logarith uh, with an exponential function here, with an exponential decay. And so the Lambert-Beer law tells you that if you have a certain frequency and you travel a certain distance, the amplitudes come down. And so that's also one of the reasons that uh, when I speak in here, you might hear me outside, but you're not hearing the same frequency spectrum. The frequencies are all attenuated in a different way, and it's because of this relationship. And so for an ultrasonic signal that is produced here at time zero at five megahertz from the previous example, if it travels by this really odd number of 27 millimeters, don't ask me why, uh, it, uh, after 35 microseconds of travel, it has now decayed and it has decayed in two, in two ways. The overall intensity came down, but it shifted frequency. So here are the two frequency spectra here. You see frequency from zero to 10 megahertz. This is the original one, which is dashed in the second plot. And then the other one is shifted by about 300 kilohertz down. Frequencies are, are, are diminished. And so now you already have a shift of 300 kilohertz. That is a lot more than that 0 0.0002 of the original frequency. So that doesn't really work. And you might say, well, so what do you do? Well, when you see me walk here, then uh, you see that I'm moving, but you don't see, uh, you don't see it because uh, I'm emitting some kind of Doppler shift. You see it because I change position. It's as simple as that. And ultrasonic waves, when they travel, they have a very nice property. They have a, a maximum, so there would be some kind of intensity here, but they also have these transitions through zero amplitude or zero pressure, zero particle velocity. And so these zero interceptions, they can be tracked. And so if you take this signal here and plot it across here and make a two-dimensional intensity plot out of it, you will notice that this fast time axis from 33 to 38 is remarkably similar to this one. So the structure that you see over here is this pulse on the left, just a bit, little bit longer. Uh, if you take that and you look several times, uh, in this case, you look over a certain period of time, make measurements, and you track me as I'm walking, you track the blood as it's flowing, you see that there's a shift. And you take that shift, and you plot that shift as a function of time, you relate the phase to what it, where it comes from, what's the frequency, what's the wavelength, all these things, you, at the speed of sound, you can then measure a speed. It's as simple as that. Uh, it comes, of course, with its own problems, but it, it works really well. And it's implemented on, on any standard ultrasound scanner. And it's then used uh, to visualize blood flow. Now, can you quantify it? Well, yes, you can. Uh, you might remember that there was this angle in there. So you don't necessarily know what the angle is. You can correct for it. Yes, it can maybe work. Uh, it can be a little bit tricky, but it can work. Uh, but what we're really interested in is not a velocity. What we're interested in is a, is a flux. Uh, a flux is a, an amount of, 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 of volume of material that is coming through per time. And so uh, in, in terms of blood flow, you don't want to know how fast the blood gets from your heart to the brain or into other end organs or your limbs. You want to know how much gets there because the more it gets there, the more oxygen comes in, the more nutrients come in, the more waste can be uh, carried back out. And so you're really interested into the flux. 
And when you do it with traditional methods, you run into these problems that our lumens, our vessels, they're not necessarily circular tubes. So you don't know what the geometry looks like. You don't know what the angle is. The flow can be difficult. Uh, when the blood comes out here out of the heart through the aortic arch, it is crazy. It's totally turbulent. And there can be other reasons. You can have plaque in the neck. There can be all sorts of reasons why the vessels are not circular. And uh, arterials are, or ar arteries are mostly circular because of the muscular wall. Veins are not. Veins have all different kinds of shapes. And so because of all these reasons, we're reverting to Carl Friedrich Gauss uh, on the German uh, 10 mark um, bill here, uh, together with the equation. So if you want to cheat in high school, you just take out old currency. Uh, and Gauss said, hey, if you take the flux and you integrate it over the surface that you're interested in, in this case, the cross section of a blood vessel, you can do this here. You can actually compute what the flux is. You don't need to do angle correction, where you can say, well, you have this dot product. Don't worry about it. It, it, it cancels out. Uh, and so you can now measure a flux. And now we have another live demo here. And I want to harp again on we're not interested in velocity. While the velocity can help you, for example, to solve the Navier-Stokes equation, uh, we're mostly interested in, in, the, in the flow itself. And my question to you is, well, uh, here you have two different experiments, or two different scenarios. You have a kitchen sink, or no, actually a lab sink, it's not a kitchen sink. The lab sink here, and you have the Mississippi River. Uh, they, they have something in common, they have something different. Uh, Monica, yeah, get started. Monica is pouring water into the system here, and you can see up here there are three beakers, and they are connected here, and the water is coming through at the same velocity, but they are not filling at the same rate. And they're not filling at the same rate, and that's because the tube on the left has a much larger cross-section, the tube in the middle has a smaller one, and the tube on the right has the smallest. And so it's almost like if you go to the gas station, you're going to fill your car. You're not going to fill your car based on the velocity that the gas is coming out and stop it. It's like, well, I'm going to have one minute of a foot per second or something like this. No, you don't want that. You want X gallons to get in your car, period. And so in this example, you saw how these beakers filled very differently. Thank you, Monica. Uh, filled very differently, and the, they filled with the same velocity because they're all fed by gravity, and uh, everything falls at the same rate. That, and I know there are boundary conditions, there's viscosity and all that stuff. Forget about it just for a sec. Uh, the, the point here is that there are different cross sections, that's why they fill at different rates. And so here for the Mississippi River and for this lab sink, uh, I, yeah, lab sink, I got it right this time. Uh, they're both flowing approximately at 50 centimeters per second. Again, yes, they can be a factor of two, but I'm a physicist. I live by orders of magnitude, not by these trivial factors of two. And so uh, they, they flow at immensely different rates. The Mississippi River is roughly 6 million, uh, million liters per, per second, and the lab sink here is at 200 milliliters per second. So velocities can be useful, but you shouldn't really use them if you can do something about it. So um, now I'm uh, going to explain something that wasn't in my original talk, but I thought box plots. Some people might know what a box plot is, and some people might not know what a box plot is. So let's take a little discourse here. Uh, I got this from this website. You can Google everything. And while you can Google everything, you also need to understand it. And um, it's amazing how uh, things are available on, on the internet, and you can go out and educate yourself. It is really, really good. But you always need to be careful that, oh, maybe I missed something. And depending on what the magnitude of the questions that you need to answer, you need to think more or consult other, other sources. Um, and so in terms of box plots, imagine you have two teams that are competing and uh, they're scoring. And uh, here are the scores here from 0 to 30. Uh, team 1 has scores pretty consistently between 10 and 20. Team 2 has this wide range of, of scores from almost 0 here to almost 30. And uh, in order to visualize that, what that distribution is, or how well they did or not, uh, you, can, you can take this, this data here and put it in a, in a, different, in a different shape. And so uh, you can model that uh, the distribution of these points follows some kind of Gauss curve uh, that has a, um, uh, a mean, it has a width, and so it has characteristics that you want to convey and kind of convey in some, some kind of other fashion. And that's where these box plots come into the game. These box plots are uh, structures that have certain features. Uh, they have uh, a box in the middle is the median. Uh, on the edges are the, the quartiles. So typically this means then it's the 25% range and the 75% range. And then you have these whiskers that can be, uh, they can be defined in various ways. In this case, it's based on the 1.5 times inner quartile range, which is 
is this range here, but it can be others and then it's uh, denoted. But these box plots basically tell you that, well, here's a distribution. Uh, this is where it ranges over, and this is where it's mostly concentrated, i.e. where the box is. And so we use that uh, in order to look at clinical data. Uh, while doing experiments in the lab, including these here, uh, with the flowing water, they can be very controlled, they can be repeated many, many times, they can be understood really well. If you do stuff in the clinic, it's not necessarily this case. And so here is a, uh, a, a figure from a publication by Dr. Pinter, who is sitting here in the audience. Uh, and um, in, in this case, we were looking at umbilical blood flow in pregnant women, uh, of the, of the umbil umbilicus of the, of the fetus, and we were comparing two different populations. We were comparing uh, moms with normal pregnancies and moms that experience preeclampsia. Uh, preeclampsia is something that is uh, more and more seen. And uh, for those that don't know preeclampsia, this is from Wikipedia here. It's a disorder of pregnancy characterized by the onset of high blood pressure. Or at least there is, there is, there is something that's called preeclampsia. It's associated with high blood pressure, maybe other conditions. And uh, we, were, we were interested in what the venous blood flow looks like. And first it was anecdotal because we, had, uh, we were looking at normals, so to say, and uh, there were some data points they were low. We thought, well, okay, we made a mistake or it didn't work. But they subsequently turned out to have a condition. Uh, one or two actually had preeclampsia, and we subsequently learned that. Subsequently, the clinic learned it, and we thought, wow, oh, that's pretty cool. So uh, it's, it's not a bug. This is actually a feature. We saw that there is something going on. And then subsequently, we studied more, and we saw a pretty good uh, uh, difference between blood flow in normal pregnancies and blood flow in, in preeclampsia uh, pregnancies. Now, they overlap. Completely aware of that. Um, there is still work that needs to be done because if you have something that can see something on a population average, that just means that you have an idea that something's going on. It doesn't help a given patient. Uh, if you're up in here in this range, you would say, well, okay, I'm pretty far away from the preeclampsia group. But if I'm down in here, then I'm with the preeclampsia group and then maybe you need further evaluation. But at least it gives us hope that there is something that can be uh, um, uh, elaborated on. And well, done in a more sophisticated way. Another thing we saw in here is an, an image of the umbilical cord. And this is kind of backwards, but it has to do with which direction the umbilical flow goes. Uh, here are the two arteries, and arteries are usually depicted in red. And as a physicist, you will say, well, that doesn't make sense, but let's not get into that. And uh, uh, there's one vein. And what we do is we look at the venous flow here, and uh, we had seen that if you do the traditional measurement that is based on the velocities, there was a very coefficient of variation of almost 50%, so point, uh, 0.46. Our uh, variation was only about 18%. And so we had, we had shown with this that not only can we do this in a more reliable fashion because we're not relying on these conditions like circular tubes, no turbulence, uh, known angle and all these things, but we could also uh, have more reliable and uh, a better trust in the, in the experiment. So that, that, was, that was really exciting. Okay, we're done with 50%. Let's see what time it is. 11.06, all right. Well, we're actually done with a little bit more than 50%. But, um, and I'm expecting questions later on, so you can already get your cards and write questions. So let's shift gears and uh, let's have a question for the audience. Uh, which body part is regularly clinically checked, but never with ultrasound? Or at least not that I know of, and I should know it. Any, any takers? Heart. Which? Heart. The heart? It's checked with ultrasound. It's called echocardiography. Good try. The knee? The knee? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's musculoskeletal ultrasound. Sorry, that's actually a good specialty. And U of M is really good at it. The brain? Uh, yeah, brain is really hard because uh, you have the skull here, uh, but you can go through the temple uh, and you can get some, some images of the middle cerebral artery. And they're, they're not bad, but they could be better. Um, anything else? The eyes? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, yeah, the eyes. Um, it's coming. Uh, actually, one of my coworkers had an exam here at the Kellogg Eye Center, and he sent me his ultrasound image. And I thought, oh, wow, this is really cool. Thank you so much for doing this, but I don't like the image. Uh, it, uh, it wasn't done with my favorite machine. Um, but uh, yeah, the eyes are not really, not, not really done much. Uh, any last ticker? Lungs? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, don't? Okay, I can count on that one too. This is fun. Um, so lungs, 
you can't get ultrasound into the lungs easily. And I'm, when I'm walking, this lady here is, is constantly focusing on me. Sorry for the trouble. Um, uh, lungs are really tricky because also you have this impedance mismatch. So you have um, uh, soft tissue here on the outside. It's mostly water. And then suddenly you hit this barrier where you go into, into the gaseous space of the lung. And now you have a very different impedance. So you get tons of reflections. But what turns out uh, to be previously an artifact I'm going to step a little bit back. Maybe I get feedback here, um, but still with the camera. Um, uh, the images look really weird, and people said, oh, don't do this. This is not a good idea. These are just artifacts. But it turns out that you can actually see uh, uh, changes in the lung, uh, pathological changes in the lung with ultrasound. And because of COVID, lung ultrasound went up like crazy. Uh, you could do a lot of lung ultrasound with COVID patients to see what's going on with the lung, and we'll see a lot more in the future. So that's another example of, well, this is terrible. No, it's not really terrible. Let's, let's find something useful out of it. An American express, uh, expression is if somebody hands you lemons, you make lemonade out of it, right? And so, okay, uh, what we do is periodontal ultrasound. And I always call it dental ultrasound, and people say, oh, crowns and, and roots and bones. Like, no, 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 that's, that's not quite it. It's a little bit, but not quite it. So periodontal ultrasound means we're looking at the soft tissue surrounding these hard structures. So we differentiate between soft tissues and hard tissues. And traditionally, ultrasound transducers are quite large. This is a, a 3D one with a mechanical contraption in there to swing back and forth. This is the one you saw previously. And what we would like to, is to have a transducer that is, is actually about this relationship with the tooth. Um, so we can make the teeth bigger. Well, that would be an interesting concept. Uh, 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 but we can make the transducers smaller. And so we have succeeded in making these transducers so small that they are basically the size of a toothbrush and still image. So this transducer here is 16.2 millimeters here on the aperture across, and in there are 128 elements at uh, up to 30 megahertz response. And uh, we'll get into what that means uh, in just a second. And so this one uh, first started out as a prototype. Uh, we tested it thoroughly, and uh, we were really excited. Uh, and so in the first test, what we did was in a cadaver study here, this was in uh, published in 2018, uh, we looked at ultrasound images, at cone beam CT images, so radiographic methods, and then we did direct measurements. And what you see here is an implant that is screwed into a jawbone, and up here is the soft tissue, here is the bone, and this was the overlying uh, periodontal tissue. And first, uh, we imaged it with cone beam CT and with ultrasound. Here you see the threads of the implant. Here you see the soft tissue, and this is the line of the bone. And up here you see the abutment of the, uh, of the implant, and above it is, is either more of the abutment or maybe a crown. And on cone beam CT, you get this image. Now, uh, I just want to make clear, we're not here to replace radiographic methods. Radiographic methods are awesome. They are very, very good. Uh, they can image bones. They can image, uh, lung, uh, not lungs, but they, they can image hard tissue. So in this case, uh, they can image the jawbone. They can look into teeth. They're very, very good. But what they're really bad at is uh, looking at soft tissues. And soft tissues are important. And if you talk to a periodontist, of course, they, they, they love soft tissue because it's their specialty. Uh, and so let's see what we can do with this. Here are the, the conditions here for the physicists in the audience or those interested. Uh, 12, 24 megahertz uh, frequency range. Uh, 128 uh, and 64 micron wavelengths. And for those that have trouble imagining, well, how small or how large is that? Copy paper is about 50 to 100 microns thick. So our wavelength is about the size of the thickness of a copy paper, or maybe two, depending on which one you pick. If you have really thin copy paper and you go for the 12 megahertz, then it's a factor of two. But so you can imagine that, wow, these are really small wavelengths. That means we can really image soft tissue with that. So let's see what we did. We measured the bone thickness on the previous example. And because this was a cadaver study, we could first image, then we could do the direct measurements with calibers, and we could compare. And so we took the ultrasound and compared it to the direct, and we took the cone beam CT and uh, compared it to the direct measurement. And here, here are the distributions, but here are the uh, biases. And so ultrasound was about 33 micron under, and uh, cone beam CT, uh, this just says CT, but it should be cone beam CT, was 230 micron over. That actually means that both of them are, were, were operating exactly within specs. Uh, you cannot do much better than 33 micron with ultrasound given the wavelength. 
And with Combian CT, it's about the same. It's because of its point spread function, its resolution. This is, this is very, very expected. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And so we really needed to show, yes, this works. And so this was a very interesting study where we measured more than just bone thickness, but because of the time constraints, I don't want to get into more. So uh, while this is, is quite easy to do, uh, in, an, in, a, in a bench top cadaver study, we also want to do this in vivo. We want to do this in the clinic, and we want to do this in, in cases where it's more complicated than just looking at a single implant. And so the interproximal space, i.e. the space between teeth, between crowns, is actually quite tricky. And it's for the same reason uh, tricky as, as the rib cage. Monica, you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, as the rib cage, uh, when you image the heart, you need to go between the ribs and then behind the ribs in, in, this, in, this, in this sturdy container to protect the lungs and the heart. Uh, you can now find the heart and you can image it with ultrasound, but you need to get between the ribs and that produces clutter. And so I want to uh, illustrate now in this experiment here, this is a water tank, there is a, there is a plate here uh, that excites surface waves. And these surface waves travel now down uh, away from the, from the source. And uh, they, are, they are uninhibited, they are just traveling down here, they are at some point uh, diminished and then maybe reflected by the walls, but most of them are, they are just traveling away. Now, Monica will place uh, two uh, cylinders in there, and these two cylinders will now disturb the propagation of the sound, or of the mechanical wave, not sound, mechanical wave, and you will now see that there are no uh, direct waves past them, but they can bend around them, they can go in between them, but they, they produce these shadows. And so, Monica, can you place them closer to each other? Thank you so much. Uh, and it may be a little bit farther away from the source. Maybe three times the distance. Uh, yeah, we keep, we keep going. Uh, maybe this is, yeah, maybe this is good. Yeah, leave it, that's fine. Uh, so, past the cylinders, you don't have sound. So, these cylinders would basically be the same as crowns. And we have our ultrasound transducer here. We can go around it, but we're not interested in it. We're interested in the one in the middle. And you can see that there are waves going through. They are, they are uh, somewhat inhibited, but there's this interference going on here and these reflections from these cylinders, and they're cre greatly compromising the image that we get. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you so much. Um, and so there's the ultrasound transducer again. Uh, here is the gum tissue here all around. Here are the crowns, and we want to go in here into this inner proximal space, and we want to image there. And uh, for these for these uh, experimental uh, visualized uh, reasons, uh, we have trouble with that. And so at some point, people came up with this really great idea. Maybe it was by mistake, and maybe it was really genius thinking. Doesn't really matter how. Uh, people said, well. We can actually do something. Here's another equation, now a complicated one. Uh, we're not going to get fully into it, just a little bit. But what it's about is that we have now two different frequencies. We have a frequency F0, it's the fundamental, and we have the frequency 2 times F0, which is the harmonic. Sometimes it's called the second harmonic, and I really don't like that, because for me it's the first harmonic and not the second, but it's what it's called. Um, and so um, you have your transmit signal, and people have seen that for soft tissues in the body, if you hit them hard enough, they go nonlinear. That means if you send in 12 megahertz, you can get 24 megahertz back. So if you listen at 24 megahertz, you see the harmonics of, 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 of the soft tissue that are produced there, but those crowns or those ribs or those heart tissue structures, they don't produce that second harmonic. So now you can filter. That means you put a, uh, a filter on the receive frequency spectrum here at 2F, and you remove the clutter from those heart tissues. In the same way as that works with the heart, with ribs, this works also uh, with, with the crowns, and it produces much better images. And just to go a little bit into this equation, it's really interesting how the nonlinear propagation of sound now has a mixture in the, in the partial differential equation between space and time. It even has a third order differentiation with respect to time. So you can, anticipate, you can appreciate that when you model this with numerical simulations, that this can become really hard. And I know this is, for modern technology, a simple equation, but imagine that you don't have just um, uh, one ultrasound transducer, but you have an array with 100 elements, or some of our arrays nowadays have 15,000 elements, okay? So now we have four orders of magnitude higher. As physicists, orders of magnitude. So you can be beaten very easily with the complexity in the system. And so we're grateful for advances in technology, but we still have limits, which is okay. Uh, we're fine with that. We always had limits. 
And so let's look at the response here. Uh, this is a straight image at 12 megahertz. So low frequency, small, uh, larger wavelengths, not as good images. At 24 megahertz, twice the frequency, a better image, but it still doesn't look that good. Then we apply fancy processing schemes called either spatial compounding, I'm not gonna get into it because of time, or we do harmonics as well. I showed you the harmonics case, uh, just uh, uh, an illustration of it. If you progress from the left, from this basic image at low frequency, no special processing, to the one on the, high, on the right with higher frequency, more sophisticated processing, including compounding and, and, and harmonics, you get a much better delineation. And so when you wanna look at dental structures, you really need high frequency because it is so small. All right, uh, this is a study by Dr. Barucci. Uh, it was just, uh, I think it was published this year, fairly recently. And uh, this, this, was, this was really nice in the sense that um, uh, we were looking at clinical cases. Here you see uh, crowns, you see the, the implants with their abutments. This goes into the jawbone. And then we have the, the superimposed uh, soft tissue, the periodontal and mucosal tissue. On the, on the right side, you see ultrasonic images of those uh, in, in B mode. Uh, and there are many, many structures that are laid out here in, this, in, the, in the legend on the right, including a peri-implant lesion. You see how the brightness changes here. This is the regular healthy soft tissue, and then you have a lesion. And we're still studying this. There is still a lot of work ahead of us. And what we were looking at is peri-implantitis. And uh, for those that don't know much about uh, Im implants and related uh, complications, uh, we were looking at the perfusion uh, of, of, of those soft tissues. And here's the overlaid uh, uh, blood flow again in, this, in these color maps. And we were looking at three different categories. We were looking at normal healthy uh, patients. We we're looking at those with peri-implant mucositis and peri-implantitis. And for those that don't know, this is from Wikipedia again, uh, peri-implant mucositis is affecting only soft tissues. And then periimplantitis is affecting soft and hard tissues. And if you talk to a periodontist, they will tell you that, well, first something will go wrong with your gums, and that will then propagate into the body, into your heart tissues, or maybe even systemically. And just recently, one of our radiology co uh, colleagues was approaching me and said, you know, I had somebody in the scanner, and they actually had an infection that probably originated in the oral cavity. And I thought, wow, this is great. Not for the patient, but to make this connection, because otherwise, I, my, my project, my, my project uh, this one, has not much to do with radiology, where my main appointment is, but it's always the same body, and so there are connections, and medicine will help us to discover these connections. And so let's keep going here. Uh, we were doing a quantitative analysis. We we're looking at these color pixels, and here's the equation, which I'm not gonna get into, and we could produce these box plots that you learned earlier, and we could differentiate these three cohorts. We could differentiate the healthy down here with the least amount of blood flow, and you can see what the, what the whiskers on the box plot look like. It's very confined here. Then we have the peri-implant mucositis that is clearly different from the healthy tissue, and we see that it's a higher range and also more spread out. Well, people might be at certain levels of, of infection here. And then we have the, the more uh, concerning one, the peri-implantitis with the most blood flow. So with this, we have the ability to have a quantitative objective way of looking at infections in the oral cavity. And maybe we can figure out how to design therapies, how to observe uh, the healing progress, and how to make recommendations for a patient on a very specific patient-by-patient -patient case because we're deriving numbers that are specific and objective and can hopefully be reproduced between uh, clinical uh, observers and between different machines. Okay, future steps. Both volume flow and periodontal ultrasound still has a lot lying ahead, and that's great because that's what we do. Uh, this is why we go to work in the morning, and this is what keeps us up at night sometimes, including preparing for this talk. Uh, but it's, it's, it's great joy. Uh, it can be frustrating, but it can be very, very rewarding. So I would like to acknowledge uh, my immediate collaborators, uh, Albert Chen, Brian Folks, Marilia Ishida, uh, Stephen Pinter, Fabiana Zoki, Jonathan Rubin, as well as the larger team. And this is not even all of them. These, I try to be really diligent and include everybody that is included, uh, has contributed to the slides here, as well as uh, the physics demonstration team. Thank you, Monica. Uh, 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 Roy Clark for inviting me uh, to speak here. Thank you very much. Uh, the live stream team, thank you for, for operating the equipment. 
Uh, I would like to thank the sponsors, the National Institutes of, of Health, the uh, Dental Craniofacial Research Institute, uh, American uh, Society of Echocardiography, Delta, Delta Dental, and the AIUM. Uh, none of this actually works uh, with a single person. It only works with a team of people. And uh, it is always, it, it, there are so many different facets of it and so many details, so many things that need to be taken care of. So nothing of this works without a team. And I really want to say thank you to everybody that has contributed here. People are pointing here, that's great. Okay, I'm gonna let it dwell a little bit. Okay, Roy is coming. Okay, now we're doing questions and answers. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Oliver, for a beautiful talk. Uh, very instructive. And, um, it definitely gives us something to think about when we're in the dentist chair, uh, wondering what all the technology is doing uh, <laughs> and the procedures. So uh, thank you for giving us those insights. Thank you. So we've got a lot of interesting uh, questions from our audience for you. I was sure this uh, topic was going to raise a, lo a lot of uh, interesting questions. So let's uh, make a start on um, on those questions. And uh, could you? <clears throat> there are a number of questions related to the the kind of information that different medical images uh, provide, including of course, ultrasound, but also X-ray, CT scans, um, even uh, MRI, although I think the area of your uh, clinical range is probably MRI is, is not very commonly compared with, with the kind of images that you've been uh, uh, talking about anyway, could you say a few words about what what are the advantages, disadvantages, what, and if if combining different mm -hmm. techniques sure, uh, sure, sure. can produce uh, can provide information that's uh, really yeah. useful. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> our body is a biological system and an emotional system, and it cannot just be projected on a simple imaging technique. Our body is really complex, maybe the most complex things in the world. Uh, uh, and uh, ultrasound is one way of looking at the body. So is CT, so is X-ray, so is MR, so is nuclear medicine, anything. Uh, measuring my blood pressure it has one meaning in one person, another meaning in another person, but there is a, there's a population average response that makes it a useful tool, and so that's why we use it. Uh, ultrasound, um, uh, often it's called ultrasonic imagination because the images can be difficult to interpret. Uh, but with enough uh, practice and expertise, uh, they can be very revealing. The beauty of them is that ultrasound is cheap. Ultrasound shows you real-time images. So as you scan along, you get images and you can basically browse around and see that you find uh, what you're looking for. And um, uh, they're non-ionizing. There is no harm uh, with ultrasonic imaging. Though it's still a medical device, and there was something a uh, few years ago where one of the celebrities bought an ultrasonic scanner of eBay and started looking at their unborn child, and that raised a lot of uh, um, uh, concerns, uh, because you just, you don't do that. Even though, yes, it's, it's benign, but it's only benign if it's used in the right way. Uh, in a very easy way, you can run somebody over with an ultrasound scanner. It would be a side effect, but a very unrelated side effect. But uh, ultrasound is, is very benign, but it has limitations. You cannot just do anything with ultrasound. And as I alluded to with the dental, comb beam CT and x-rays, they will never go away. I shouldn't say never, but they will not go away anytime soon. Uh, because they look at different properties and they can do things that ultrasound cannot. And the same is true for MR. Uh, uh, MR and, and CT uh, and, and nuclear medicine are called cross-sectional imaging modalities. Uh, sometimes people forget that ultrasound is as well. But I, I think uh, people refer to it as cross-sectional because you can just go straight through the body. Take a whole, a whole cut through and you, you push somebody into the scanner, you push a button, uh, you, you run a scan and you get a great 3D image of a body. Now, yes, there are, there are details with that, but it's more straightforward than ultrasonic imaging is. Um, so there are trade-offs, and we're always uh, well advised if we are doing educated choices of what imaging modality we, modality we choose for what. 
but we should always have open ears for new things that are on the horizon, like ultrasound here for periodontal imaging. <clears throat> there are a number of uh, technical questions uh, which kind of overlap with both physics and electrical engineering, probably. Um, uh, there are issues to do with, um, with resolution and bandwidth. So um, one, one question that was interesting uh, concerns the, uh, the effects of the element spacing on, uh, on bandwidth and resolution. Could you give us a bit of more information about that? <clears throat> yeah, uh, as I uh, demonstrated uh, with this experimental setup, size relates to the, to the frequencies of excitation and they then relate uh, to the, to the uh, what we call in, in, a, in, a, in a systems approach or an imaging approach, the point spread function. And the point spread function means that if I want to image a point right here, if I want to image this point, I look at it with my modality, how big is this going to appear? And that point is not just a, a circle or a sphere, it has a complex shape. With ultrasound, there is something called side lobes and, and grading lobes uh, with other imaging modalities as well. Uh, everything um, has a various degree of sophistication to it. Uh, with ultrasound, ideally you would have really high frequency and you would be able to image a lot. Well, it comes with trade-offs. If you want to image at high resolution, you need high frequency. High frequency does not travel far. I, I, I put up a, a loudspeaker in here at, at 10 kilohertz, and you'll probably not hear anything out there. But if I run a loudspeaker here with five hertz, you might hear it all over campus. It's because sound is attenuated in various uh, ways with, with its frequency, and so we need to be mindful of, of having the right excitation for the right application. And so on the ultrasound machines, there's always a, a, a range or <laughs> an array of arrays, right? A, a range of arrays, and they are used either for abdominal imaging, for peripheral vascular imaging, maybe now for dental imaging, uh, and you always need to make a trade-off. Uh, with MR, uh, you have a little bit of an advantage in terms of running a longer sequence will maybe give you more resolution, but it's limited as well. And we have done, uh, with Dr. Pinter, uh, done an MR study where we compare ultrasound with MR. And while our expertise is with ultrasound, we've learned a great deal about MR and we have seen, yeah, uh, sometimes we expect too much. We always need to be realistic, but I don't want to downplay anything. Uh, medical imaging is fantastic and it's only getting better. And um, a related question was um, the effects on nonlinearity, either in, in the transducers or in, in the response. And how, how can that help with the uh, differentiating uh, clutter uh, from scattering? I, I'm not sure yeah. that I've kind of represented that question correctly, but no. there's an uh, interesting... Uh, Always, when you do this kind of technique, you you have a choice between a linear response and then a, a, a non-linear. Non -linear. Yeah, uh, yeah. So as as I when when I showed the the nonlinear wave equation, uh, uh, you know that in physics everything turns nonlinear at some point. It just matters how big your hammer is that you hit it with. Uh, with with ultrasound, um, uh, with ultrasound. Uh, there's linear propagation, there's nonlinear propagation. And that nonlinear propagation can be exploited in a way to overcome artifacts. Um, it requires transducers that are wide band. And um, that's not easy to do, but material science has improved. Uh, the way how ultrasound transducers are constructed has improved. And I don't have time to get into it. There are new ways of trying to make ultrasonic transducers work. But what you achieve with it is a wider bandwidth. And that wider bandwidth then allows you to play tricks with, uh, with frequencies. So you can excite at one frequency and listen at a higher. You can even look to lower frequencies. There's something called ultrasound contrast agents. And these contrast agents, uh, they're, um, gas-filled microbubbles that are injected. They are the size of red blood cells and they circulate in the system. And that was something that I did for my masters when I came in 1996. 
And uh, when, you, when you take uh, physics and you go through your uh, theoretical physics uh, lectures, at some point there's something called the Duffing Oscillator or the, the weak nonlinear uh, Duffing Oscillator. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very beautiful concept of an oscillator that changes characteristics as it goes through its cycles. Well, those are these, these gas bubbles. They do exactly the same thing. If you're a gas bubble in water and you oscillate, you're displacing the water that is around you. And if you're a tiny little gas bubble, you displace very little water as you oscillate. And if you're a big gas bubble, you displace a lot of water while you oscillate. And so now you have, uh, 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 let's say, uh, a traditional spring that is oscillating or a swing that is going back and forth that is changing mass. And that's why these bubbles are so fascinating and make a great uh, uh, master's thesis in, in physics but they also make for a great application in medical imaging. And so these gas bubbles have become sophisticated or were engineered with, with gases in there to make them survive circulation for a longer time. Uh, they have ligands on there so that they can attach to certain types of cancers. They can be used to make pressure measurements. Uh, there are all sorts of applications where you exploit the uh, abilities to deviate from the regular expected behavior where you go away from linear behavior, go, you go to nonlinear. And um, again, it's that you have to look at the physics and see what's going on. And then you need to find the engineering uh, that actually makes it feasible. Because again, you can do something in a physics experiment in a lab, but it's a long way until you're actually in the clinic and you can do it by non-experts of the technology and you can do it in a reliable and economical way because it needs to be cheap too. Otherwise, it's not going to be used. So this, this is a, a question that um, a lot of researchers around, around the U of M are, are interested in from the point of view of optics and uh, doing measurements on spectroscopic uh, systems. And it's to do with... In, including uh, or modulating the, the beam, ultrasound beam, with the chirp signal. So chirping the, uh, obviously uh, you, you've got, in, in a lot of the transducers you use, you, you mentioned five megahertz, which right. is a single oh, yeah. frequency. Right. Right. What are, could there be advantages, oh, as there are in spectroscopy, sure, sure, to sure. chirping the, yeah, uh, yeah, the yeah. frequency? So when, I, when I say five megahertz, well, that's the center frequency. Uh, uh, as you saw, there are pulses. Pulses don't have a single frequency. Pulses have a frequency spectrum, right? Uh, if I would have a single frequency, it would be an infinitely going on signal that, that has one frequency. Um, so uh, all ultrasound that is transmitted, except for a very, very small uh, exception, are uh, finite duration, they are finite frequency spectr uh, spectrum. Um, and uh, yes, people have done something called matched filters. They have sent out codes, coded excitation. Uh, I think that's where the, the speaker, or the, the, sorry, the, 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 the person asking the question uh, is, is going. And um, we have used that in the community to overcome limitations of sound propagation with attenuation. So if you want to keep your same system, uh, you have a certain ability of producing sound at a certain pressure magnitude. And you cannot do more because you would hit uh, either the limits of your, of, your, of your system or you hit the limits of the FDA, how much sound you can introduce into the body. You need to find other sophisticated ways of still recovering signal. And so if you send a chirp, you can then uh, get closer to the noise floor and you can make a filter and uh, figuring out, well, is there a signal in there that looks like my chirp? There are other things that are called Barker codes uh, and, and, and others that have a certain pattern and you look for this pattern in your signal. And so while uh, a sinusoidal excitation is maybe more trivial, that can also then show up easier in the noise floor. But if you send a sophisticated pattern, uh, you can find that pattern. Oops, that was me. Oh, that's okay. Um, and uh, now I can't go back. Um, maybe that means I should stop. Uh, and so with, with that pattern, it makes it easier to find the signal and recover resolution. Uh, with the chirp, the resolution is not as good when you recover it as if you do it with a more sophisticated coded excitation. So uh, there is electrical engineering involved here. There is physics involved. There is material science involved, biomedical engineering. Uh, computer science, if I forgot it, uh, of course, medicine, biology, all of these things are involved in making these systems a success. 
And again, they didn't reach its limits yet. Uh, there are always new applications coming. And um, uh, uh, they, are, they are at various degrees of implementation. And it takes medical centers like the U of M uh, in order to um, go through, because private practice will probably be the last one on average to adopt to new technology. Uh, academic medical centers are the ones that have the scientists and the clinicians that are interested in furthering uh, the fields. And so we're really relying on those uh, in order to uh, come up with new technologies. Yeah, so a lot of exciting uh, developments in, in the field, even though it's, it, it's been around for a while, there are yeah. many, many uh, things yet to be explored with, with the technique. Yeah. Um, could you describe some um, non-imaging modalities? Uh, for example, one questioner asked about uh, kidney stones. Um, what, what can be done in that area? Yeah, so uh, we always uh, differentiate ultrasound into the lookers and the cookers. And uh, I think it was Matt O'Donnell that, that coined that term on, on, on North Campus with our biomedical engineering group. Uh, naturally, the lookers are the ones that make images or produce images and use them. The cookers are the ones that do the intervention, that alter. Uh, uh, partially, it's, it's literally cooking. Uh, there's something called high-intensity focused ultrasound uh, with which you can heat tissue. Uh, and that is already done in the, in the, in the clinic. Uh, this is done with, uh, with uh, interventional uh, radiology uh, that either stick uh, 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 metal probes into your body and use RF ablation in order to cook tissues, cancerous tissues, uh, or actually do the opposite and do ice balls, freeze the tissue, or maybe do freeze thaw cycles in order to kill the tissue. They're all different kinds of approaches and they have very meaningful uh, ways of doing it and reasons to do it. Uh, and ultrasound is one where you maybe don't have to stick anything in because you have a wave that travels there. Uh, the most well-known one, the most, the most uh, uh, historical one is kidney stones and that's lithotripsy, where you basically blow up uh, tissues, uh, I mean stones, with an ultrasonic wave. And it's done by a, uh, by a, uh, a spark uh, uh, gap uh, that is in a parabolic uh, reflector. And so it's just like a parabolic antenna. So you have this spark that is suddenly discharging. It launches an acoustic wave. That acoustic wave is reflected by this ball into the body and is focused on the kidney stone and you blow up the kidney stone. Uh, there are groups around the country that come up with very sophisticated solutions for blowing them up in a more controlled way, uh, harming the tissue less that is surrounding the stones because just charging something in your kidneys, while it has the advantage of uh, lowering the, the size or reducing the size of those stones that you can pass them by peeing them out, of course it has effects onto the surrounding uh, soft tissues. And I'm not an expert on that, but I, I know some of it from, from, from conferences, from, from, from the literature, et cetera. And uh, there are still amazing advantage, uh, 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 investigations underway where people look at the soft tissue response. How can I minimize, for example, the inflammation that goes along with this treatment? How can I blow up or, 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 or break uh, stones that are of certain sizes? They're of certain chemical compositions because they're not all the same. Maybe even how can I uh, destroy gallbladder stones? They are very different. They're very gummy. Uh, it's not as easy to erode them. And so people are trying uh, to produce more and more non-invasive uh, uh, approaches to therapy. Uh, two others that come to my mind uh, in terms of the therapy. Uh, one of them is histotripsy that's done here on campus, uh, originated here on campus. And that's not blowing up of stones, it's destroying soft tissue. And you can imagine that as an erosion of soft tissue, also by ultrasound, and it's slowly emulsifying tissue as it eats its way, just like a Pac-Man in the 80s, through the soft tissue. It's a small focus, and in that focus, very controlled, you can erode tissue. You can erode tissue to a degree that you could also just pee it out or you could aspirate it with a needle. It's, it's a beautiful technique that will bring many generations of interventional radiology along and be used in the, in the human body. Uh, and the last one for now is something that we do in our lab. Um, 
that uh, Dr. Ali Abusa here in the audience is working on, uh, and uh, that is uh, drug delivery with ultrasound. Uh, ultrasound has the advantage of being an imaging modality and a therapy modality at the same time. And so what you can envision is that you follow the bloodstream, you image uh, where uh, uh, a drug that is injected into the body is flowing in these micro bubbles, and that's where it ties together, uh, in these micro bubbles or similar constructs, and you say, okay, here is a location, and I want to treat this location. I want to do something. I either want to uh, destroy tissue or I want to promote growth of tissue. And so you can image that you're at the right side, it's targeted. Uh, you can then release the drug there, and you can basically have a local delivery of drug. So instead of injecting it systemically with an IV injection, you can still inject that IV, but it's not released. It's, it's in these shells, it's in these droplets and bubbles that flows through and then locally release it. Now you could say, well, it's released there and then it washes straight out. Yeah, that's true. That can happen, but we have also seen that we can actually stop the blood flow there too. So what you can envision is that uh, the bubbles are coming in on the arterial side where the arteries are still large before you hit the capillary bed. And then you actually stop the blood flow in the capillary bed, but release the drug there for a certain amount of time. Short enough to have the drug interact to a certain degree and be extravasated and taken up by the cells, but at the same time have reperfusion again so that the tissue doesn't demise in, in this region. And so there are a lot of different strategies for going about therapies like that. Here. So uh, another question came up uh, related to a previous one, and that is, uh, uh, can ultrasound uh, beams be uh, be focused to uh, very specific points. For example, during uh, the the periodontal uh, the periodontal right right yeah peri implant uh, yeah. <laughs> studies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, and it's actually interesting. Um, uh, people outside the field, uh, for example, for drug delivery, uh, they had used ultrasound in order to uh, deliver drug with ultrasound, um, but. Uh, some of the folks in, 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 in those research efforts uh, use different types of ultrasound. Uh, there are very many different types. What we use is focused ultrasound, meaning that we have, a, we have an emitter that can be fairly large, that can be focused down to a millimeter or sub-millimeter, depending on the frequency. But there are also ultrasonic sources that do exactly the opposite. There's a small tip, that small tip vibrates and produces an acoustic wave that is outgoing, that is then totally unfocused. And so it's exactly the opposite of what we are doing. And so uh, in the work that uh, Dr. Ali Apusa does and uh, Dr. Fabili, and I skipped over his pumpkin with the P.06 that I thought was really uh, nice. Uh, what they are doing is a uh, uh, patterned drug release. So that means that in, in, if, you, if you look at these rows of seeds here, you could say, I'm going to treat this seed, but I don't treat that seed. I treat this seed again, I'm skipping that one. It's so focused that you can, uh, down to the resolution of your system, uh, can have a very specific approach of treating one region but not another. That's, that's one. There's a spatial control. There's a temporal control because you can say, well, I'm going to do it now, but I'm going to do the other one tomorrow or sometime after, maybe an hour after, depending on your drug. There's a third one that is, I can be specific to the drug. So now I can have a red pill and a blue pill, and I can have a release of the red one first, and then I'm gonna release the blue one. And I can not only uh, have that injected and flow through the bloodstream, but I can put it into implants, not the dental implants, but into scaffolds, like soft tissue implants. So if you have a bone loss somewhere, or if you have soft tissue loss somewhere, or you lost uh, uh, an artery or a vein, you can put an implant there and you can regrow tissue. You can have drugs in there that promote growth of, 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 of soft tissue, that promote, promote the ingrowth of the surrounding tissues, and often, as, as, as biology is, it's a complex system that is not just done by one drug. But the work that is done in our lab uh, uh, sheds light on the possibility of actually controlling it by time, by location, by drug, in order to regenerate tissues. 
And again, this is, this is going to be fantastic, that magic wand that is going to go across us. At some point, we're getting closer and closer to that because we can do non-invasive surgery. We can do non-invasive drug delivery. We will be doing a lot of non-invasive things. But nothing is a miracle. It's all science. It's technology. It's time spent for investigations. I think we're getting a signal here that um, the screens are going black and soon the lights will be out. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Um, can, um, let's see, let's try, uh, let me ask this question. Uh, how, what has the response been from the dental community, from the doctors about, about these techniques? Well, maybe similar to wearing masks. Uh, there are people that think it's great and there are people that think they, 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 that's, that's a weird thing to do or they don't want to do it. Um, it all has to do with open minds. It all has to do with, uh, there are people that embrace technology and there are people that say, well, I don't know it, so I don't like it. Um, but uh, uh, being uh, uh, um, an academic uh, medical and, and, and dental uh, institution, uh, it's such a joy to see uh, trainees, uh, to see people at, at all uh, levels of their learning and at their life path uh, being interested. And uh, ultrasound, uh, almost like uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence, had a long history of uh, a certain level of ability or, or, or performance. And that is changing. In the same way as machine learning has changed, ultrasound has changed. Ultrasound went to higher frequencies, better resolution, smaller sizes, smaller machines, more portability, more utility. And um, it always takes a certain amount of time in order to get technology into the use. Uh, but again, because of academic institutions, we have an ability to tap into it. It's like the impedance matching here, okay? So you need to see where do you do what and how in order to convince people. And again, uh, you need to show results and people will be excited. To see the difference between different levels of inflammation, I think it's exciting. And looking through the soft tissue, I think it's exciting too. If we have these devices available for purchase and people buy them and use them in the clinic, I think they will get excited. Um, I want to finish up with a couple of questions that relate to the future, <clears throat> future use uh, of uh, ultrasound. Uh, one of them is, can ultrasound, <clears throat> can ultrasound, <clears throat> excuse me, Replace uh, <clears throat> replace mammograms. Uh, is there a, a, a future for that? I, I never want to say replace. <laughs> uh, replace is an absolute term. Uh, does ultrasound provide advantages uh, over mammograms? <clears throat> yeah, it does. Uh, now I have the same thing going on. Maybe there's a virus spreading. Um, um, there, it's um, it's non-ionizing. Uh, it's a lot less painful. Uh, I can't speak from personal experience, but I wish there would be uh, more involvement of women in, in research regarding breast cancer and, and mammograms in that sense. Um, but there's a lot, there's a big movement. Uh, I think it was Maine or it was one of the North England, uh, North England, uh, no. what is it called? New England. New England, thank you. Ah, gosh, New England states uh, that said, we gotta do ultrasound. We gotta do ultrasonic screening. Uh, uh, hardware becomes more sophisticated. Uh, ultra, mem mammograms are encompassing a large region. Uh, while they're projection images, uh, they can see uh, a, a breast in a, in a much faster way, in a much more standard way than handheld ultrasound. And so there are things out there like ABUS, automatic breast ultrasound, uh, and other systems that are very reliable, uh, can be very easily standardized, and uh, can uh, do a great deal to reduce uh, false positives. That's what we really want. We don't want to do biopsies uh, on women where it's not really indicated. So that's what's called a false positive. And with ultrasound, you can reduce those. And, and, and another good thing about uh, uh, breast cancer, and it, breast cancer is not a good thing, but a good thing in terms of uh, the, the healthcare that can be provided in the imaging is that uh, more and more breast cancers are at a stage, are detected at a stage where you watch them you don't do intervention immediately. And that really means that we're starting to catch them earlier. It's the same for, for prostate cancer. 
Uh, prostate cancer is at a, at, a, at a state where you do this watchful wait, and you go in for your uh, annual or regular checkups, you do imaging, you do your PSA levels, and most likely you will die before your prostate cancer kills you. And uh, that, is, that is fantastic that we have imaging abilities that catch things earlier, because then we have more choices in terms of intervention. So I, I think that would uh, represent it. Okay. Then um, is um, in the in clinical study of uh, of uh, uh, pre uh, eclampsia that you yeah. that you described. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is the variation in, in, the, uh, in the results there, the, the, the kind of spread of, <clears throat> of data, um, due to patient variation, or is it due to the technology that still is being under development? Yeah, yeah. Um, at first, I don't know, because we're just starting with this. Uh, but it's most likely both. Uh, the data that we took, uh, um, can be improved. Uh, we can do this better. We can do more controlled studies. Uh, we're already working on an, another way of, of looking at it, which I don't talk about now because we're still in the process of publishing it. Um, but it's going to be really interesting in the sense of uh, understanding better what the fetus does, uh, what the placenta does. And it's very exciting. Uh, to look at the physiology that is in this placenta fetus system. What does the fetus do? Does the fetus signal to the mom, hey, I need more blood, I need more nutrients, something is going on. Is it the placenta that is sick that the fetus is then showing the response of because the fetus is not growing or there are other things going on with the fetus? There is still a lot of light that needs to be uh, shed on, on, this, on this type of, of uh, obstetrics that so far wasn't possible. I mean, yes, you could have done MR as a, as a general, oh, let's throw MR at it, or nuclear medicine, or CT. Uh, but you don't do that uh, uh, with, with a fetus. Uh, uh, tomographic uh, imaging systems always involve more time. Uh, uh, when you image a fetus, uh, Dr. Pinter has, in, has been involved with lots of fetal scans. And uh, he knows really well that as soon as the mom starts sitting down, the fetus starts moving or waves the umbilical cord and says, hi. Uh, it, is, it is unbelievable. And so with ultrasound, because it's such a quick modality, you really get a chance uh, to take uh, imaging data uh, that is not as time constrained. And so there is more that can be done. But again, uh, biology and the human body and everything that is involved with it is only projected onto these various imaging modalities. There is no one solution. But there are many, many contributions, and that's what we're looking at. We're trying to figure out what can we do with ultrasound to shed further light onto an underlying condition that is not even fully understood yet. And so <laughs> we're trying to solve two things at the same time. How can I observe something that is not known yet to a degree that we wish? Because as we learn more, in this case, about preeclampsia or inner uterine growth restriction, the more we learn about it, the more we actually get an idea of what we should be looking at. So it's a race with multiple components that are moving. Mm -hmm. and, and presumably um, that other, other techniques are being developed uh, in addition to the one you described. It's such an important uh, issue to be, uh, to be addressed. Uh, so how, how do they stand? Uh, uh, what, what are the other techniques that have been... Uh, or, uh, not to go into much detail, but... Oh, no, I, 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 I can't speak on that intelligently right now. <laughs> so, um, but um, other techniques that are used are involving ultrasound. Uh, there are probably techniques outside of ultrasound for this as well, but uh, there are lab tests that are done. There are blood pressure measurements that are done. Uh, uh, there are, I mean, yeah, these lab tests, maybe urine tests, blood, blood tests, and all these uh, types of evaluations. Uh, Preeclampsia comes with, with uh, something else that is tested with, with blood uh, uh, evaluation. Um, but we want to contribute to it and not replace anything. Uh, I, I really want to stress that. We want to help to shed further light on the development. We want to see which comes first, 
the egg or the chicken. What, where does it start? Does it start in the placenta? Does it start in the fetus? You cannot really do biopsies on the fetus. I mean, yes, you can, but you really don't want to. There are certain medical conditions where you do a biopsy on the mom during pregnancy, but you really do this if you don't have any other choice. So with ultrasound, we're really trying to be non-invasive, to be sensitive to changes, and we're trying to have this in a way that it accompanies what's going on in the clinic already. Maybe we'll replace other techniques, but it's not really meant for that. It's meant for better understanding. Right, well, uh, uh, <clears throat> thank you for all of the questions that came in. And this is obviously a, very much a work in, in progress and an exciting area to be working in. And we thank you for giving, giving us this insight into the field. And uh, I uh, want to call on the audience to, well, uh, to thank you again, and uh, let's have a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you for having That's me. really awesome. Thank and you. And thank you for the questions. And if you have more questions, I'll stick around a little bit. I'm happy to entertain more. Thank you. <laughs>